people have been watching the choice that Britain has made. I would reassure those markets and investors that Britain's economy is fundamentally strong. But the British people have made a very clear decision to take a different path. And as such, I think the country requires fresh leadership to take it in this direction. Britain has spoken, but the shock waves will be felt throughout the world. While the United Kingdom's parliament considers its next steps towards a Brexit, African economies are already starting to feel the brunt. As the biggest contributor to the European Union's development aid budget, much of which goes to Africa, Downing Street may be hoping to fall back on its trade relations with Commonwealth partners. But others say that the cost of Brexit is yet another reason for Africa to look east for economic support. So what can African governments do in the interim to mitigate the knock-on economic effects? And what will business be like in Africa after Brexit? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, after the historic Brexit vote, economists are warning that Britain's exit from the European Union could have widespread implications for the global economy over the next three years. Africa has strong trade ties with Europe. And just two weeks ago, a new partnership was signed between the European Union and several Southern African countries. As CCTV Sumitra Naidu tells us, many are worried about this partnership going forward. Britain joined the European Union in 1973. Two years later, a referendum was held and favoured the UK staying in the EU. When the Eurozone, an economic and monetary union to coordinate economic policy, was launched in 1999, Britain chose to keep its own currency. Britain now wants to leave the euro area completely. The key thing to understand is that it will be the British Parliament that announces to the European Union that it wants that, to take the country out of Europe. So that requires a solid majority in the British Parliament. This current Parliament was not elected on that ticket, so they will have to go to new elections. The only way to go to new elections is to have a no-confidence vote in the government. Now, given that the Prime Minister has resigned and it's not obvious who would take his place, it's possible they may get that no-confidence vote, but then they would have to go to a national election. Global markets are in turmoil. For Africa, the worry is now over trade deals that may have to be renegotiated. Until the exit package is agreed upon with the European Union, Britain will remain a member of the European Union. So it will be part of the common market until the exit button is actually pushed. Um, the next question then is what replaces that? And we. We're talking a minimum of, of three years, I would say, before that button is, is actually pushed. South Africa is Europe's largest trading partner in Africa. For South Africa, though, it means that we would have to look to negotiate a separate trade deal with the UK. What that will do is it will obviously stifle trade in the short term, and it depends on what trade deal we can get in place with the UK will determine how successful we are in accessing the UK market going forward. Once Britain leaves the EU, it will no longer be part of the Eurozone and will lose preferential trade partnerships with the world's biggest free market. This could reduce the UK's appeal as an investment destination. There are many companies in South Africa that have direct uh, business links with the UK. There are many companies that have opened offices in the UK with implications of being able to move throughout Europe. They would have to relook at that and decide, do I relocate from the UK into mainland Europe in order to get better access to the European Union? Three years is a long time to wait until Britain is settled as an independent player in the global economy. There's growing concerns that the UK could also suffer a recession. For South Africa, the timing couldn't be worse. Subdued growth from Europe will drag South Africa's already weak economy further into demise. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV, Johannesburg. Now, while Article 50 is yet to be invoked by the British Parliament, the implications for the African continent are already hitting home. We spoke to citizens from across the continent to gauge their understanding of Brexit's impact. Britain has not been so much helpful. Even look at the, uh, the countries that they colonized. 
what they drop for them is corruption. If, if Germany leaves, then they will be panicking. But for, for Britain, I don't think they are offering more. The trade system, they might be affected too because the trade, the free trade in some country may be the export and exporting can be affected in a way. The fact is there's so many things which is connected uh, via Britain. Then, for example, if we have to go and reach Britain, let's say I have to take the flight, flight from here to Britain, all those costs that I used to pay, because Britain, it was, there was a connection in between us. If, the, if Britain break up that connection, which means it's going to be more expensive for us to go to Britain. And there's a people who came from South Africa who stay there in Britain. There's a people from Britain who stay, from, who stay here in South Africa. I think the idea that British want to exit from Europe is, is not going to affect Africa, particularly Ethiopia. I don't think it, does, that it will make much a difference. Uh, it's like yes and no, actually. Uh, whether they exist or not, it doesn't have much effect on Ethiopia. It might not be a wise idea for any country to consider pulling out of uh, uh, institutions like the, the EU, for example, because we are living in a global village, and I think we need each other, and they need the EU. My family and many other Somali families rely on remittance sent from UK and Europe. My older brother is in the UK. Every month he sends us around 300 US dollars. With the current pound renting, I don't think how he'll manage his costs as well as send us money in the coming months. Largest uh, foreign direct investment Nigeria has comes from Britain. So definitely what it portends for Nigeria is that there's going to be a drop in that foreign direct investment from, from Britain. So that's a negative impact for Nigeria. Africa sells its products, the European Union. They have got to negotiate. Now they are going to negotiate differently with Britain, which is in the disadvantage of Britain. But when they negotiate with a group like the European Union, like the African, Air, Caribbean and Pacific, they come in on the same terms then the countries benefit. So this is going to have problems on Britain because Britain will have to negotiate differently with different countries. The shocks are there and they are felt everywhere, but I'm sure the situation will get calmer and things will sort of normalize, but the decision is fundamental and they are already talking about having another referendum because I think you have over a million people already with a petition to say, no, did we make the right decision? So let's watch the space and see. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, my expert guests will help chart the way forward for Africa after Brexit. Stay with us. Let me be very open with you. I do not see any way of Britain taking back their decision to leave the EU. And we all would do ourselves a great favor if we would accept this as reality. This is not a time for wishful thinking, but a time of facing reality. A time of facing reality. That was German Chancellor Angela Merkel speaking about Britain's Brexit decision. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now to help chart the way for Africa after Brexit, I have expert guests standing by in London. Alex Vines, he's the head of the Africa program at Chatham House. In Washington, D.C., Dr. Ola Bello, he's the executive director at Good Governance Africa. He's based in Lagos. In Boston, Grieve Chalwa, he's a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for African Studies at Harvard University. And with me in Nairobi, Ambassador Boaz Mbaya, he's the executive director for the Center for Policy Analysis here in Nairobi. Gentlemen, to you all, welcome to Talk Africa. Alex Vines in London, I'll start off with you. The world is still grappling with the Britain's uh, exit from the European Union. First, and very briefly, your reaction to the results of the referendum and the reaction in the aftermath. Well, first of all, Britain hasn't exited the European Union. Uh, there's a referendum that is not legally binding. It's an advisory. So we still don't know whether Britain will exit the European Union or not, and we might not know for quite a few months yet. But uh, my reaction to the referendum result was one of uh, disappointment, but not entirely surprise. The deindustrialized parts of the United Kingdom, particularly in the Northeast, in the Midlands, and in parts of Wales, all voted to exit the EU. And that's to do with class and to do with inequality and to do with the lack of opportunity. 
So this was a protest uh, vote and also a call for help. And uh, I hope that certainly British politicians don't ignore that. But I think there are broader international lessons for Europe and beyond on the result that occurred through the referendum last week. Dr. Ole Bello in Washington, D.C. Um, well, I think, um, you know, the vote is um, clearly a very disappointing outcome for many of us. Um, we were hoping that somehow um, we would be able to shift um, the debate on the UK's membership of the European Union um, in a much more positive, um, enlightened direction, if you want. Um, ultimately, I think the outcome um, represents um, an exercise in being counting, if you like, um, because there are legitimate concerns that voters have with regards to um, runaway um, uncontrolled immigration. But I think the beauty of the European Union um, transcends all of that. Um, let's not forget about it. Um, this has been the longest um, period of peace um, in Europe after the World War II. And I think um, in many senses the European project has contributed to that. Now that's not a question you can put down to a yes or no right. answer. Um, and I think some of those nuances um, got lost a bit. But like Alex, I hope that we can find um, a positive um, or a more inclusive um, solution on a way forward for everyone. Right. Grief Chelwa in Boston. Um, well, I mean, to, to start with, as an economist, uh, my first reaction was to sort of try to figure out uh, the impact of uh, the referendum result on, uh, say, African economies. And, uh, precisely just to think whether this is going to have any serious impact, uh, what the impact will look like. But uh, like my other two colleagues have said, uh, I think the, the big thing here is to figure out, as we try to integrate in Africa, what sort of lessons can we learn from uh, sort of Britain's relationship with the European Union? Ambassador Mbaye. Well, I found it uh, unexpected, disappointing. But I think a little bit in keeping with the British tradition of opt-out uh, uh, options within the EU. Uh, it looks like uh, Britain has not grasped the meaning of globalization and I suspect it is going to hit them uh, quite hard and there is a bit of rethinking. That's why they cannot invoke Article 50 uh, yet because uh, as Alex said is an advisory uh, referendum and who knows they could change their, their mind about it. I, I think they, there is quite a bit to lose by Britain if they move out. Yes. So Alex Vines, the, the three issues here that have come out, the, the issue of inequality, the issue of uh, integration and the issue of the economic impact here. Uh, let's start off with that whole question of immigration that was topping the debate there in the run up to the uh, referendum. What's the post-immigration, the immigration issue going to look like now after this referendum vote? Yeah, uh, immigration was one of the drivers for the vote to exit the EU. There's un undoubtedly that's the question and it's more uh, openly discussed now in the UK than it has been for, for a long time. Uh, but but this, let, let, let's be clear, this is not about African immigration, this is about m immigration migrancy from members of the European Union. That's where the biggest fear uh, w was played. It's about Poles, Lithuanians, Estonians uh, and other members of the European Union getting jobs and, uh, and making lives in the United Kingdom. And it was particularly hard felt in the marginalized, uh, deindustrialized parts of the UK where competition for jobs and opportunities are so intense. Uh, Britain's going to find it very difficult, I think, if it wants to remain with free and unfettered access to the common uh, economic area of the EU, so the common market. Uh, with, uh, if it wants to put barriers up on European uh, migration and the movement of people and goods. So I think some of the promises that have been made in this Brexit campaign right. by the Leave campaign that they would be able to control European Union migration into the EU is going to be very difficult to actually implement. Yes. And so, again, I think this is one of the reasons why this whole thing will probably need to be politically rethought in London. Griff Chalwa, though, that, that's mentioned. Uh, Griff Chalwa to you, though, Alex does mention that it is actually about immigration from uh, other European Union countries. But there are increasing numbers of African immigrants coming in through North Africa. What's your take? Um, like, uh, I mean, 
First of all, I'm not an, a migration expert, but uh, I think I'll take Alex's word for it. Uh, my reading is precisely what he said, that it's really much a uh, debate about immigrants from most the rest of Europe competing for jobs in Britain. And uh, I think over the last decades, uh, Britain has deindustrialized, and then uh, jobs, probably there are more jobs in the services sector, and those jobs require people who are sort of highly skilled, and if there's a skills mismatch or probably your education system is not producing enough skills, then you have a feeling of dis discontent. So in some ways, I sort of echo Alex's take on this. Dr. Olebello? Well, um, <coughs> my sense is that, um, you know, the whole debate about the Im um, uncontrolled immigration or badly managed immigration in the UK and the way that um, the average citizen somewhat holds the European Union um, responsible um, for this unwelcome state of affairs is actually representative, um, representative um, of the way that the larger debate on, on, Brit on Britain's membership of the European Union has played out. There are a lot of nuances in this debate which I think um, has first been difficult um, to convey um, to ordinary voters but also um, politicians on both sides um, of this debate in the way we've seen it played out um, sometime um, played very loose with the fact and I think that has not helped um, in terms of the ultimate outcome. All right, uh, Dr. Uh, Ambassador Mbaya. I want to agree with Alex on the question of immigration but I think the immediate trigger of uh, sentiments and emotions is really the number of refugees and uh, who are coming from Middle East and also from Africa. And to a certain extent, Britain is uh, responsible for the destruction of uh, stability in Libya. And that's why Libya itself cannot control uh, migrants wanting to move to, to Europe. So it's a combination of factors. And w whether we want to focus on uh, European uh, migration alone, it, it, I don't think is enough. We need to take it in, in context in terms of the overall immigration uh, factors that are coming from outside uh, Europe itself. Right. Uh, Dr. Grief Chalra, though, the, the, the whole question of uh, integration and economic integration in particular, because African countries have been pushing towards uh, enhancing their regional economic uh, communities, and they've been looking at uh, deeper integration, economic, political, as the way forward. Uh, what are we learning, though, from the European Union regarding that? Um, I think, I mean, the thing is, uh, integration, economic integration is incredibly desirable. If you think about Africa, right, uh, there's very little intra-African trade that currently takes place. And this is a pity because uh, the African market is about one billion people strong, and that's like a really big market that African countries can tap into. Uh, so it would be really nice if we could integrate economically, sell lots of goods and services to each other. But at the same time, I think what we learn from Britain's experience is that we should also not forget about uh, the, the, less, the less of our people, right? So in Britain's case, the discontent, like Alex has said, is coming from people who feel left out, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, it's a truism that uh, integrating uh, in some ways trade makes everyone on net bet better off, but there are some losers, and uh, as we integrate, we have to always think about the losers. So if, if for instance, Zambia sells, uh, starts selling lots of products that uh, Nigeria used to make, and we start selling those products to Nigeria, what, are we, what is the Nigerian government doing about workers who lose jobs uh, precisely because of that? So I think uh, we have to have a very careful and balanced approach and uh, thinking about everybody in terms of integration. Alex Vine. Well, look, this is going to be a particularly difficult uh, issue for the United Kingdom government, given that they've just uh, had a referendum about withdrawing from a regional community, uh, the European Union. Uh, one of the planks of British policy has been to institution build uh, and support regional economic communities, the African Union. Uh, I'm not sure how the British government is going to uh, reframe that narrative now of what was one of the planks of British foreign policy, one of their kind of pillars. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that develops. My own view is that we need more integration uh, it, with globalization. We are more interconnected. And so I do find that what the referendum result here, although I understand it, I feel it's counterintuitive uh, to, to the global forces of globalization that we're facing. My worry about this is that I don't think the United Kingdom is unique in this experience. 
My biggest single worry that w uh, uh, as a lesson out of this referendum is what? that I think it enhances the chance of, for example, a Trump presidency in the United States. The drivers in the United States are not dissimilar. If you look at the Rust Belt in the, uh, in the Midwest and the drivers are people there moving towards supporting Trump. Right. So I think the UK should be a warning for the United States as it moves towards an election. Ambassador Mbaya, of course to you that question as well, but I do also want to get a feel of uh, what, what exact impact though is, is uh, this referendum going to have uh, in terms of the geopolitical relations uh, for Britain and Africa, in terms of uh, uh, probably uh, the political realities now? On paper it shouldn't uh, have any impact, but politics is not about paper. Politics is about realities. And the realities are that if Britain moved out, moves out of the, the European Union, it's going to be a much weaker Britain. And therefore, its economic uh, influence internationally will be so diminished. Uh, I, I want to believe that uh, the, the, the referendum was probably won on local issues, like Alex said, in terms of the inequalities between the, the poorest parts of Britain and, and the, the, the richer parts. But when it comes to policy uh, uh, towards Africa, for instance, uh, Britain is going to have less influence than it has within the, the European community because uh, she is not, uh, she's not United States, not, not China, not India. Uh, and, and so uh, Britain's voice will be much more diminished than it, it has been within the U European Union. I agree with Alex. I don't know what policy they're going to pursue. Right. And, and I think to be uh, a whole realization and probably re-examination of uh, British foreign policy towards uh, developing countries in general. Let's, let's get uh, your view, uh, gentlemen, there to, to all of you. Uh, are we going to see now, though, a less influential Britain when it comes to dealing with matters in Africa? Are, are we going to see a much weaker Britain, though, now that it is no longer part of the European Union? First, Alex Vine to you. Look, I think that you'll see the UK priority. If, it, if the UK ends up outside the EU, we'll see some African countries becoming even more important and greater priorities for the United Kingdom to see. So if you're in Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa in particular, I think you'll see even further deepening and uh, more British resources and attention. Uh, my biggest worry in the short term of this referendum result is actually the, uh, the, the, the liquidity issues that we're right. seeing globally, especially for, uh, uh, for the currency uh, fluctuations across the continent. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the currency fluctuation, especially related to the, the price of the dollar, this is going to hit an, uh, uh, countries with high debt in particular. So if you're Ghana uh, or, or South Africa, um, or Mozambique or certainly Zimbabwe which has an acute liquidity crisis and there's already a run on the dollar this is a really bad situation for you and it's going to play out for a number of years um, and so I can see some real hammering of indebted countries where the debt to GDP ratio is very high. Right, uh, uh, Dr. Griff Chalwa. Um, oh yeah, I mean I'd like to agree with uh, both speakers in saying that uh, a Britain outside of the European Union is a very weak Britain uh, with respect to Africa. It's, I mean, it's, for instance, uh, total exports to Britain from Africa are only 5% of Africa's total exports. Our biggest, uh, like some of the colleagues have already said there, our, our biggest uh, uh, sort of partners are China, uh, the European Union, the United States in terms of trade. So uh, Britain outside the EU is a very diminished Britain. Britain on its own in terms of global GDP is between 2% and 5%. So it's very sort of tiny in relative terms. Um, now thinking about sort of the economic impact uh, in terms of what Alex has said, I mean, I agree with him to an extent, but not so much. Um, what we are seeing now is that the markets are already stabilizing. And I think p what, what happened was that the markets were caught a bit unawares by what happened on Thursday. And now we see some the market stabilizing. Of course, the pound has been sort of collapsing, but I don't expect uh, this sort of stability or volatility to continue into the foreseeable future. Calm is set getting into the markets. Uh, the, financial, the financial experts are beginning to realize that, okay, a little bit of the uncertainty has been resolved as the days go by. So I don't expect a really big 
uh, economic impact unless maybe for the rand i see the rand is quite volatile and that's precisely because um, a lot of like uh, uh, companies are joint listed on the Johannes Johannesburg stock exchange and the right. london stock exchange and then there's a, there's a very big uh, uh, foreign direct investment uh, component from Britain into South African banks, for instance. Right. But otherwise, uh, it should be plain sailing uh, from now on. Yes. Dr. Olebello, though, as we talk about a more diminished uh, Britain now outside of the European Union, do you think that this would probably uh, make China a more attractive economic partner now to Africa? Well, uh, my hope certainly is that um, all of these partners can be attractive in Africa and that we Africans can um, relate to them economically and otherwise in ways that are ultimately beneficial for development um, on our continent. Um, there is no escaping from the fact um, Britain is an attractive um, hub for many international businesses as a gateway to the European Union. I think um, is that much more diminished um, when um, the United Kingdom um, um, w leaves the European Union, and as it seems, I'm um, quite um, likely now. Um, but I think there are also um, opportunities that players in Africa can explore um, pragmatically. Um, Alex mentioned um, Kenya, Nigeria, Ghana, and the rest of them um, may be um, becoming more attractive for the European, um, for, for the United Kingdom. I think it caught the other way as well. If you look at what the Buhari administration has been trying to do in Nigeria, a country with huge agricultural p potential, frittered away a lot of the, um, you know, petrol dollar that were had boom years. Right. Now Nigeria needs to return to agriculture big time, and I think a market like the UK might just provide that sort of outlet they've been seeking with the European Union, which has really not materialized them um, over the past few years. Ambassador Mbai, you have the final word. Let me say this. One, uh, as I came to the studio, there were reports that important companies, including British companies, were moving out, were considering moving out of London into the European Union uh, to create their headquarters is there. It means shifting financial services from London will weaken the British economy. Uh, it will make it smaller. Therefore, what Alex is suggesting may not even happen because Britain will not have the money to uh, finance all those uh, aggressive foreign policies in Africa. The second thing is that the referendum is likely to tear Britain itself, the United Kingdom itself, into pieces. Scotland have expressed the, uh, anger at the, the results. So has Northern Ireland. And, and I think if you have uh, uh, disintegrating United Kingdom, it is going to play very little ro role uh, internationally. And therefore, a uh, diminished position by, by Britain is a very large, likely event to, to come from out of this Brexit. All right. And yes. gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, that's all we have time for this weekend. Thank you to my guest for your insights. In London, Alex Vines. He's the head of the Africa program at Chatham House. In Washington, D.C., Dr. Ola Bello. He's the executive director at Good Governance Africa based in Lagos. He's joining us today from Washington, D.C. In Boston, Grieve Echelwa. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for African Studies at Harvard University. And with me here in Nairobi, Ambassador Boaz Mbaya. He's the executive director for the Center for Policy Analysis. Thank you very much for joining us. And remember to join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do join us again next week for another edition of Talk Africa. Goodbye.